culture. Food was fuel. And the best food was like cheap food and a big plate, right? It wasn't like growing up in France or Italy or even Australia. But now, everybody wants to take a photo of their food and they want to talk about the restaurant that they went to and they buy 3,000 euro uh, pieces of equipment to make various bits and pieces of food at home. It's amazing. There's never been a better time to eat, especially to eat internationally. We are trophy hunters. We want to eat at the new Peruvian restaurant or the Nepalese place that's open down the street. I live in New York City, where they have like every kind of food in the world, except one. They don't have a lot of Indonesian food, and that's my favorite food. <laughs> if I was in Indonesia, I would probably want something that I couldn't get there, right? So, one question is to develop an uh, understanding between taste and flavor and scent and odor. Flavor is the combination of what we smell, what we eat, and what we think. Now, we haven't prepared for this, but I'm sure you all know the experiments where you close your nose and then you put something like a strawberry and you can't taste the strawberry. Has anyone ever done that? Yeah? You can do it with uh, nutmeg, salt, uh, the strawberry one, if you blindfold people, you can do it with apples, and people are convinced that they are eating strawberries, until they open their nose and they smell it in. Because on your tongue, you can only taste, officially, five things. Sweet, sour, bitter, salt, and umami. And there's a big debate that rages among scientists if we should declare new tastes. For instance, we can taste blood, iron, on our tongue. So if they announce a new official taste blood on your tongue, it will probably be iron. And then we'll have six tastes. However, our noses can detect somewhere around 800 different odors. Which brings us on to the next one. There are a lot of people who try to eat clean these days, eat healthy, raw, organic, and they'll say, oh, I don't like chemicals, which is stupid, because everything is chemicals. We are bags of chemicals. Every aroma, every odor is a molecule or a collection of molecules. If you, you can order scientific supply houses, individual molecules. If you order carvon and you open the little tin, it smells like caraway. Amyl acetate smells like banana. And the business of fragrance houses like Givadon and Simrise and ABM Wild Foods is they make combinations of molecules and then they trademark them. So they'll make a combination of wood and musk and something else. They'll trademark it and call it Javanon, and they'll sell that molecule to people who want to make air freshener, or toilet cleaner, or perfume. It's the same division, by the way, that makes toilet cleaner perfume as Tom Ford and Joe Malone and all those ones. Perfume is perfume. But when we smell, we're using two parts of our brain. We're using our animal brain, our limbic system, and we're using our, uh, our cognitive part of our brain. So, the gustatory part is when we think about something. We think, hmm, yeah, it's a steak, but I had another steak, is this now better than that? Uh, is it too well done? We're consciously thinking about it. The animal part of our brain, in the limbic system, doesn't think at all. It bypasses conscious thought. The famous example everyone gives is uh, the French author Proust's book, A la recherche du temps perdu, where the author bites into a pastry, a madeleine, and suddenly, oh, he remembers everything from 14 years ago. That's how it goes. 
we build our sense memories most strongly from the age, between the ages of five and ten. And after that, uh, they do change, but much, much more slowly. So, if you were eating strawberries for the very first time, when you fell over and cut your leg or something, you're probably going to have a negative association with strawberries for the rest of your life. Right? These sense memories are immensely, immensely powerful. And we can't always control them. So if you're a parent, or you look after kids, it's really important to have positive experiences with sense, right? So try and make sure that the kid doesn't, you know, fall into uh, a river when they're eating bananas or something like that. So you scare the bananas for the rest of their lives. Now there's, it's BCB. So I'm sure as many of you are extremely experts on uh, aroma and flavor. And something really interesting is we don't know for sure how it works. The most common example is Axel's theory, for which they won a Nobel Prize, which is that you have odor molecules floating around like jigsaw puzzle bits, and they float up your nose and they lock onto a receptor. Like that. Boom. It's sometimes called the lock and key theory. But you can't prove it all the time. So scientifically, it's the best theory that we have, but it's not perfect. It's not like gravity. Gravity always works. But the lock and key theory doesn't always work. It gives you a good basis to go on. Has anyone here ever heard of uh, Luca Turin, the Emperor of Scent? He wrote a very, very good book called uh, The Secrets of Scent. Turin was a chemist and uh, trained as a biologist and was just interested in fragrances and perfumes and aromas. And he came up with what he calls the molecular vibrational theory, which is that molecules that vibrate at the same speed smell like one another. So that's how it works. We construct flavor from things that vibrate at the same level. So, Carvone, the one I mentioned before, smells like caraway. And you can isolate Carvone from caraway or from a component in jet engines. It's very interesting, but Turin's theory also has some holes in it. It doesn't always work. The lock and key theory, the uh, Axel and Ron Creef theory, also doesn't always work. And the odotope theory also doesn't always work. It's a combination of psychology and, and physiology, which I think is fascinating. Because our sense of smell, our sense of taste, is extremely important to us. Well, actually, question, English language answers only, shout it out. When somebody can't see, what do we say? How do we call them? Blind. Blind. And if they can't hear? What? What do we call it when you can't smell? Anosmia. Very good. Anosmia, is always cool. Anosmia. Uh, can happen if you have an accident, uh, you can be born with anosmia, and there are extremely higher rates of suicide for people who have anosmia. And it's also very, very dangerous, because it's one of your senses, right? You can't smell, imagine if you leave the gas on, you can't smell it, right? You can't smell the, the dog poo around the corner, okay, that's not so dangerous. But Anosmia is very, very bad. There's uh, parosmia, where you kind of misalign stuff in your head. Have you ever heard the idea that nobody sees blue all the same? I see blue, you see yellow, you see green, but we all agree it's blue. There are some people who like smell roses and it smells like dog shit to them, right? Or they smell lavender and it smells like citrus. They've literally got their wires crossed. Which is also kind of a problem, it would be a big problem if you were a bartender. And phantosmia is when you hallucinate aromas, you think you smell something. There's a lot of this going on with uh, people with mental disturbances, and it happens a lot with people who have Alzheimer's and dementia, 
they, they literally begin to hallucinate smells where they don't exist. Question! Uh, it's certainly part of it. That's a definite uh, thing that happens with strokes. And um, indeed, medically, there are actual ways uh, that smell helps us too. So it's good that you bring that up. They are developing robots. I used to say robots, but now they're actually developing robots that can uh, diagnose you by smelling. So if you have diabetes, you probably know that dogs can actually smell if you have diabetes. They can smell the sugar in your urine or whatever. Um, people with schizophrenia secrete a kind of a chemical and you can literally smell the schizophrenia so it can be detected at very low levels by uh, people with more, not people, by devices with better senses of smell than us. So that's the, the physiology of it. I think it's time to get into the psychology of it a little bit. The words we use to describe things are very important and we usually mess it up. We say woody when we mean oaky. Uh, or you might say sweet when uh, you mean rich. People in the world of food and flavour learn to use a common vocabulary because otherwise you can't communicate with one another. Hands up all bartenders. Brilliant. Yeah. Every single night. You get customers coming in and they're like, oh, I don't know what I want. And you're like, oh, what would you like? Sweet or sour or bitter or soft? Like, oh, I don't know. Like, the fuck? Right? And those are the easy questions. Right? Sweet or sour? Bitter? You know, salt, whatever. People don't know how to describe stuff. And there's a very good case for educating kids in school about what flavor is and how it works. Not just for being able to order stuff in a restaurant but, or a bar, but so that they would understand the stuff that they're putting in their bodies. And you'd understand if something was artificially sweet or naturally sweet. So what we tend to do is use words that aren't very useful. Like, uh, people say a lot about uh, vodka, it's, uh, it's pure, right? Or they'll say about something, oh, it's got a bit of a, a chemical taste. Which is funny, because every taste is chemical. Right? Or fresh, or natural. In the world of uh, flavor science, they say, if you're using natural ingredients, you're not up to date on the technology. Which is a, about as funny as a scientist joke gets, unfortunately, <laughs> because what they mean is, if you want to get all the molecules that make the flavor of a strawberry, you can get them from a strawberry. Of course you can. But it's cheaper and easier to get them from an apple. You can get all, almost all the uh, molecules that we associate with strawberry flavor from an apple, and it's a lot cheaper. If you ever see packaging and it says nature identical ingredients, that's what they've done. They've taken the molecules from one thing from another thing. So the words aren't as useful as they could be. So you create them. First of all, you think, what is the association? What does it remind you of? If it's an apple, is it crisp and crunchy or soft and sweet? We go through this instinctively when we try new fruits. If you've never had a plum or a peach, you're going to compare it to something else soft and juicy. You might even compare it to something like a, a pineapple, right, or a mango. Then we think, what's the life cycle of this? Do you smell it, bite into it, taste it, swallow it? How do we create that association? And then we come up with a word. We come up with a word to describe it. The word might be spicy or juicy or whatever it might be. The important thing is it has to be a word that is from the vocabulary. Inventing new words only works in politics. It doesn't work very well there, right? And then the effect is what happens when you actually chew into the thing. For instance, this is a very good picture, most of the flavor of a pepper is pain. It is literally pain flavored. The pepper itself has almost no flavor. What we associate with a pepper is the capsaicin, the molecule inside the seeds. It's so spicy and painful. 
and that creates the memory for us. So, when we use words, we try to use words that uh, are in categories. So, from left to right, you would have sharp or fusel, ever real, like a neutral spirit, or hops, your, 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 your bitter flavors. For yeast, you have yeasty cognac, yeasty fermented, and woody and oak. So, let's do a little bit of an experiment here. Um, at the start and end of each row, you should have a little, a little spray marked here, which I had to bring all the fucking way from New York. And you should each have one of these Sephora perfume sprayer thingamajigs, right? Have you guys got these down there? Yeah, yeah, you got bottles too. So uh, at the end of the row, pick it up, just spray it. Good quality stuff. There we go. Just spray it. Whoops, once or twice on this. Give it a whack, and then give it a smell. So pass it down the row. Come on, be a good kid, share, share with your neighbor. All right, shout it out, there's no wrong answers. What does this smell like? What spirit does this smell like? Roses. Roses? Which one? Salt. Does it smell, does it remind you of any spirits, any alcohol? Amaretto. Aqua. Aqua. Yeah, anyone else? Amaretto. Amaretto. Alright. So what this is, is fusel. As a student of spirits, you'll know that fusel oil is one of the impurities in distilling. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, heavy, thick, oily thing. And you don't want too much in your distilled alcohol product. But if you are used to smelling this in your alcohol, you're either drinking uh, fairly low grade alcohol, or what's happening is you are drinking tequila or mezcal or ricea. Because when you analyze all the molecules in agave spirits, one of the most important largest uh, flavor elements is, is this, is fusel. So if you sniff this again, I think a little bit about uh, agave spirits, but it does smell a bit nutty, doesn't it? Yeah, huh. Right. However, we go back to my example. If you're eating a strawberry, just as your mom and dad have a huge argument and break up and daddy walks out and you never see him again, strawberries are not going to taste nice to you for the rest of your life, right? If you get falling down drunk on Sambuca when you're 16 years old, it's going to take a long time for you to drink Sambuca again, if ever, because of that animal brain response, the limbic system. We don't think about it. We just smell it, that's it. Because we didn't have time when we were still uh, nomadic hunter-gatherers to stand there and think to ourselves, okay, what's that smell? You know, we had to literally fight or flee. We had to decide if we would eat something on the spot quickly. There's no hesitation with the limbic system. And when we program something in there, it is really, really hard to deprogram. So the next slide I'm going to show is a short video clip. Uh, it's become a cliche. Whenever anyone talks about flavor and psychology and odor, we all show the same clip. This is from a movie you all know, Ratatouille. And the advisor was Thomas Keller, the three Michelin star chef of the French Laundry in, uh, in California. And the animators actually went and worked in his kitchens so that they could accurately draw the, uh, the rat that cooks in, uh, in Ratatouille. So uh, we're gonna have the, the sound up and all that. Here we go. Ratatouille, it must be joking.
comes together. The flavor, the aroma, your memories, the setting, your friends, and it goes, wow! And you almost can't create these moments. They have to happen, yeah? You try to push it, it doesn't really work. So, emotional responses are largely programmed in. It triggers a memory, neurotransmitters release all kinds of hormones and enzymes, and it's all mostly programmed before you're 10. So if you are bringing up kids, pay particular attention to uh, your household and how it smells. If you're bringing up kids, it probably smells worse because you have kids, but that's an unavoidable thing to do. One of the trickier things is, when you have a good experience, you get a good sense of memory. But it's not as strong as when you have a bad experience. When you've eaten some rotting food, or got particularly sick after something, or uh, a terrible thing happened as you were eating it. It's easier to create a long-lasting bad memory than it is a long-lasting good one. So, you owe it to yourself to only eat nice food and drinks. Speaking of which, Speaking of which, uh, Christine, I think it's time to uh, start getting our uh, samples out. Now, we did this seminar in New Orleans. We had a bit more time, we had a bit more uh, samples for everybody. But we gave everybody a mystery bottle to spray, and we asked them to identify how it made them feel from this list of happy, anxious, relaxed, irritated, calm, and sad. And um, 70 or 80 percent of the people said relaxed. It was a very common set. What is the common set that makes you feel relaxed? Who said it? Very good. It was actually lavender. It's amazing. They put it in these like drops you're supposed to spray on your pillow because it really does work, right? You know the way everyone's trying to sell you silly bullshit these days, like water with extra hydration. Lavender really, really works. So, a short side trip. We're going to talk about emotion and flavor in terms of luxury. We're just going to have a little quick tasting here. This is a saying from my fellow Irishman, Oscar Wilde. So, what is luxury? It's something that's inessential. Diamonds are inessential. This is the Coinor in the English Crown Jewels. It's not for sale until things get really bad with Brexit, but if it was, that rock would cost one billion dollars. It's desirable. Fabergé eggs are desirable, for some people at least, my wife for sure. And it's difficult or expensive to get. This is the Noma restaurant pop-up in Tulum in Mexico, and you have to book online. It's sold out. In one hour, you couldn't get a reservation. Thank you. It didn't matter if you were willing to pay a billion dollars, you still couldn't go. So that made it even more luxurious. Now, our sponsor here today is Beluga Vodka, the number one luxury vodka in Russia that's all made at the very remote Marinsk distillery in Kamenovo Oblast. Let me put it this way once you get to Moscow, you've still got one day's travel to get there. And there's three vodkas in the range, or rather we're going to taste three in the range here for uh, time constraints. The first one we're having is the Noble Siberian Wheat Vodka that's been rested after production for 30 days. So take a little nose of this, and uh, Christine, I think we get the next round out as well. And try to think to yourself, obviously you have very positive associations, you can look at me and hear me. That's only good. But think, is it sweet, sour, bitter? Does it make you think of something else? Does it remind you of any other wheat spirit? The second thing we're going to sample is the transatlantic, same Siberian wheat vodka, but it's been rested for 45 days, an extra 15 days. Not by mistake, they do it on purpose, custom-built stainless steel uh, containers. The extra 15 days might make a difference. And the person who's going to decide if it makes a difference is yourselves. The most important thing, vodka is very difficult to taste, isn't it? Right? Much easier to do a whiskey tasting or a brandy tasting. 
So many people look down on vodka and they say, oh, vodka, it's all the same stuff. It's really not. It's just extremely difficult to distinguish between one another. Unless you are, of course, the well-educated people of Bar Convent Berlin. And I've got you early on day one. This is brilliant. I've done seminars at 6 p.m. on day three before. Different story. <laughs> so, has everybody got number two? I wish we'll take out number three as well. Yeah. Compared to number one, can you tell a difference? Yeah, can you know differences? Yes. A lot of people will say that uh, transatlantic tastes more like vodka. That's because these both have, all of them have, micro infusions of one to two percent that are added after distillation. So I don't want, I hope nobody's gonna sue me, but the true Russian vodka is not blue frick. These macerates and distillates are added post-distillation. Just a tiny perfect. That worked out well. And the last one we're gonna have is the iconic gold line in the optical glass bottle. And this has been rested, as you can see, for 90 days. It's the most expensive in the range, but for flavor, you might find it's your favorite or not your favorite, but hopefully you'll be able to tell a difference in flavor. Each micro infusion is different, each vodka is different. Please hang on to your vodkas, because we're going to wrap up with a little talk about uh, sturgeons and caviar. We'll have a little bit of caviar. So with this, we experience uh, what descriptor would we use? Ethereal. Ethereal is a descriptor for a relatively pure ethanol product. No aging, no sugar, no coloring. The resting has an oxidative effect, yes, but it hasn't been aged in a barrel. Sturgeon, caviar, is going to give us salty flavors and umami flavors as well. And, relatively speaking, we'll be able to pick up some slight subtle differences in sweetness between these two. I'll uh, jump in there, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Probably instructive to mention that you should notice it before you taste it. You guys have a chance to try it? Differences? Yeah? Or is it the Emperor's new clothes? Am I like psychologically leading you to say yes, there's a difference? Most people detect quite some large differences between the three. So, subtly changing the subject. What is a sturgeon? It's a dinosaur. It is a fish that hasn't evolved. It is of the order Asapensilidae. Um, sturgeon are found everywhere in the world except in the tropical zone. No, 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 thank you. So, do you know that Germany used to be the world's largest supplier of caviar? Yeah? The D&H company in Hamburg was the biggest in the world, bigger even than uh, Petrosium. And sturgeons are freshwater whales. This is the largest one ever caught. We're not sure how long they can live. Definitely 120 years, maybe more. That one uh, produced something like half a ton of caviar. They never stop growing. The only thing that stops them growing is us. We catch them and we kill them. They are enormous and there are no sturgeon that big anymore. The rivers and lakes of the world teemed with them. Does everyone know who Jerry Thomas was? Celebrity bartender, bit of a dick. Uh, in his day, if you went into a bar in New York and they only had caviar as a bar snack, it was a terrible bar. Because there was so many sturgeon in the lakes and rivers of America that you wouldn't even feed it to your slaves. There were laws saying that prisoners didn't have to eat sturgeon more than twice a week. Right? Or lobster, incidentally. So, what is this caviar stuff? You catch the fish, you kill it, you sieve it, the eggs, and you add between 3 and 5% salt. It's called malosk. 
right? That's the only type of caviar you can really get. They used to add 14% salt and make a brick like flock wrap. They don't do that anymore. By 1876, there was no sturgeon meer born in Germany. The Elbe River was fished out. So this Hamburg company started importing their stuff from Russia. Nobody learned their lesson. America became the world's biggest caviar supplier. Does that sound weird? That really sounds weird. It sounds, you know, like Amer America became like the thinnest country in the world. But it's true. There was a town in New Jersey called Caviar, New Jersey, that sold caviar to the whole world, including Russia. But they took too many sturgeon and it was fished out after 25 years. When the USSR ended, it was every man and woman for himself. And all the carefully, scientifically managed stocks of the Caspian Sea were plundered by pirates. By 2019, 85% of all sturgeon in the world are endangered, so you should never ever eat uh, wild sturgeon. They're not better, by the way, I've had them. Uh, but you definitely should You should eat sustainably fished sturgeon, which we're having now. Caviar, please! Uh, thank you. But because of this unexpected series of events, caviar has gone from being something you couldn't give away. Christina, where are you, Christina? Christina, who's my client from Beluga, uh, caviar is very really good for you. It's full of uh, flavor and uh, protein and stuff like that. So her mum would try to get her to eat a spoon of caviar, and Christina would be like, so she had to say, if you finish your caviar, I'll give you chocolate. <laughs> it sounds like particularly middle-aged. Oh, thank you. Lovely. There we go. <laughs> so it has gone from being something you couldn't give away, the ultimate peasant food, to being desirable and both expensive and difficult to obtain. The only thing that's really important about how you eat caviar is that you don't eat it from a metal spoon. That's all. You can use plastic, you can use uh, mother of pearl, like these ones we got off Amazon. Um, you can put them in what's called God's caviar dish here, this like little thing you have on your hand, which is what some people recommend you do. Let it warm up a little bit. And I have the great good fortune of being able to tell you a little bit about this. This is a sustainably farmed sterlet, oh, I have a picture. Sterlet caviar from uh, uh, Transnistria in Romania. Yes, Moldova? Moldova. Any Moldovans here? Okay, it's Moldova. Uh, but it's brilliant stuff, we had it last year. Very, very small eggs, Ian Fleming's favorite caviar. That's why James Bond says, oh, sterlet, you know. Pinprick. You also call it uh, Sevruga um, or Imperial sometimes. It's the smallest sturgeon that there is. It's only about yay big. It's like a, a pet sturgeon. You can separate the eggs very easily. So take a little bit on your spoon or your hand and taste it. What are the tongue tastes we, de we detect? Salt? Creaminess maybe? Have a little bit more. Umami. Miss. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I can't, I still can't hear you, so. No. It's Asapensor Muthanus, the sterling. Myri is the uh, Siberian. Yeah. So you've always got the uh, taxonomic name Asapensor. And then after it, you have the specific site. So Barry is the Siberian, uh, Huso Huso is the Beluga, um, and Rufanus is the Sterlet. So take one last bowl of this. Mm. This is really outstandingly good quality uh, caviar, by the way. And then quickly go back and see if you have a pairing that you like. And I'd say this, please don't be embarrassed if it turns out you like blue and no, but this is an amazing monk. Right? We prefer transatlantic, this or that. Alright, so I've been a very bad boy.
a little bit over time. For any questions, I'm going to go over to the Beluga vodka stand now. So, this PowerPoint, if you're interested, is on slideshare.net slash philduff. If you like this seminar uh, and you'd like to have it in a more intimate setting, myself and Lucia Montanelli, the head bartender of the Dorchester in London, and the new Beluga world champion, are doing versions of this that are a bit more fun and interactive with blindfolds and stuff on the stand twice a day. So we're doing one today at 2.15. Please, please come along, hang out with us. There's some superstar bartenders making your drinks every single day. There's a party tonight that I shouldn't tell you about, so don't come to Tampa Meets Jigger at 9.30 uh, for, for brilliant times and drinks. And I'd like to say thank you very much. <laughs>